Other Prime Ministers have run the Cabinet that has traditionally been the very heart of government. Right, Jack, why, why don't you start us off with the current uh, diplomatic situation? Right. On Thursday, just after the fall of Kabul, Tony Blair's war cabinet met. This is the first time a war cabinet has ever been filmed. That's, that's, that's the Security Council resolution went through yesterday, and the terms are satisfactory. That will then effectively mean that, that um, as the situation calms, we're able to get a, a force in under a, a UN hat. Well, it's a, I mean, the hat is it that, that and I, yes, this I, I gather in the Security Council speak, is adequate. Um, and, 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 but it's not Chapter 7, it's not formal uh, authority. It no, it's not blue hats. No, no. My, uh, to run the war, the top military and intelligence people sit with Blair's senior ministers and advisers. The war cabinet was meeting in the room where cabinets have met since the 19th century to declare wars and make peace. The mood in the war cabinet contrasted sharply with the high spirits when the full cabinet had gathered for its last meeting of the summer session in July. Tony Blair's cabinet, where for the first time nearly a third are women, looks very different from the days when cabinets were all male and included many hereditary peers. The cabinet meeting came on the day that it had been announced that the Chancellor, Gordon Brown, was going to become a father. Before I ask you to come in, Robin, well, first of all, I think you should report our congratulations to Gordon. Yeah. Yeah. To join the cabinet means that you've arrived politically. In theory, the Prime Minister is first among equals, and you are one of the equals. And all those who've ever had their own red box retain a vivid memory, even after nearly a quarter of a century, of the first time they ever went to number 10 for a cabinet meeting. Of course, it was a great buzz. I mean, you know, here we were on the threshold of what then seemed like an enormously exciting journey. Well, it turned out to be an enormously exciting journey. Um, but there was all the sort of excitement of a new opportunity of having won, uh, of knowing that, you know, if power is available to you in government, you've got your hands on it. And I can remember the excitement and uh, of walking through that number 10 door and the excitement of my colleagues that we were now in the cabinet in number 10. And we all sat down in our pre-arranged seats. I was next to David Blunkett, which was a great pleasure because uh, Lucy used to sit under the table, so I used to take my shoes off and put my feet under Lucy. When they go into Cabinet, all new ministers are told exactly which chair to sit in. The Prime Minister sits at the centre in the only chair with arms. The most powerful ministers sit next to or facing the Prime Minister in strict order of precedence. And what about uh, the order of precedence in a cabinet? How much does that matter to individual cabinet ministers? I don't think it matters very much. Um, I know, I've never thought that really mattered. Uh, it's not really first-class people who worry about where they're sitting. Well, they would all show a certain distance and disdain for such trivial uh, ratings, but they care passionately. <laughs> Why? Well, because it sees where you are in the pecking order. Out of a cabinet of 23, I think there are only two had been in government, none of them had been in cabinet. So to that extent, it was new to all of us. Tony said, call me Tony. Um, and we just uh, automatically did what we'd done in opposition, called each other by our Christian names. As well as the new informality, Blair planned a radical change in the traditional role of the cabinet. He felt that a cabinet of 23 was far too large to be an effective decision-making body. He wanted to work in much smaller groups, and the most potent cabinet subgrouping of all would be himself and his longtime friend and rival, the Chancellor Gordon Brown. He's doing a bit. <laughs> He's doing a bit. The pattern was set before the cabinet had even met for the first time. Blair and Brown decided that the Bank of England should take over control of interest rates. When the head of the civil service suggested to Blair he should consult his cabinet, Blair replied, they'll agree. At the Treasury, four days after Labour had come to power, with the Cabinet still not having met, Gordon Brown summoned a press conference. I will not shrink from the tough decisions needed to deliver stability for long-term growth. 
I have therefore decided to give the Bank of England operational responsibility for setting interest rates with immediate effect. The government will continue to set... The journalists have been told about the groundbreaking decision before almost all the members of the cabinet. I read it in the paper. So, I mean, this, this big decision to, to um, privatise the Bank of England, the, the cabinet um, didn't know about it. Well, they it wasn't discussed beforehand, no. I was privy to the decision that they were good enough to tell me about it. Um, and I knew it would be a controversial decision. And uh, I think that's the kind of problem you might have had if you had a complete discussion about that. And there's all the matters of the markets and everything else. Interest rates is an area where it's always been that prime ministers and chancellors have largely made decisions like that. And there was certainly no um, disagreement with it. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose what, what people... But might... we didn't have a sit down and put your hands up, are you for this or against it? No, we didn't. All recent prime ministers have kept decisions over extremely sensitive matters, like the markets, security and running a war, to very small groups of senior ministers. But for other major matters, Blair's predecessors have made more use than him of the full cabinet. And all prime ministers have had their individual styles of running the cabinet. Labour's Harold Wilson, who won four general elections, liked to see himself as the player manager of his cabinet team. When I was prime minister in the 60s, hardly a single one of them had been in the cabinet. I had to go and do everything. It was like, you know, football, taking the set-piece occasions, goalkeeper, uh, taking the penalties and the corners. Now, of course, I have a very talented and experienced cabinet. Even so, I like to know all that's going on. Harold Wilson's style of running his cabinet was subtle and often tricky. He would sometimes deliberately set minister against minister to try and ensure he got his own way. This was no easy task in a cabinet of political big hitters from both the right and the left. I tried to keep our party together for God knows how many years now. And I did it by having all the extremes in the cabinet. There were very interesting people in the cabinet. When I look round and I think of Wilson and Roy Jenkins and uh, Jim Callaghan and Tony Crossland and Barbara Castle and so on, I mean, they were really interesting people. And I found those discussions were the best I ever attended uh, uh, in the sense that you were affected by the debate. You go, might go with one opinion and change your opinion in the light of the debate. And uh, it was that reality, I think, that gave cohesion to the government. What brings you here? <laughs> the boss. The boss. Coffee, and then they want us all out. Angus, hello, in you go. And in particular, I'll bring you all out in a moment. From the start, Margaret Thatcher knew what she wanted and was determined to lead her cabinet from the front. <laughs> Mrs Thatcher said she couldn't waste time with internal arguments in her cabinet. And she was impatient of ministers who sought to persuade colleagues in cabinet of views that differed from her own. Now we go over to the centre. It was your job to explain to colleagues what the issues were and what your recommendation was. You'd very rarely get through your explanation without Mrs Thatcher coming in to try and steer the conversation the way she wanted it to go. And the only thing to do was to wait till she paused for breath and start again. Um, and in the end, you had to steel yourself to do that. I found it very difficult because I'd been brought up in a sort of traditional British way, a sort of public school educated, where there was a sort of deference to women. You just didn't sort of, uh, you know, take them on in, in that sort of sense. But one soon learned that if you wanted to be trampled underfoot, that was uh, the way to go. She believed that every discussion should start with a statement of her own views, and that's what happened. And there were, of course, people who weren't used to arguing with a woman and they resented this fact because they thought it meant there was to be no discussion. Actually, she saw this as a prelude to a discussion if discussion was needed. If her ministers had been man enough to challenge her on policy issues, she was there to fight them over it. Trouble is, most of them ducked out. They didn't like argument. They were either too frightened for the implications of their future political careers or just didn't relish the concept of argument. <laughs> Over the years, Margaret Thatcher became an increasingly dominant figure in her cabinet. Those who'd once been her closest supporters were to be alienated by her abrasive and intimidating style in the cabinet chair. I think sometimes the prime minister should be intimidating. There's not much point in being a weak, floppy thing in the chair, is there? 
But I spent hours getting the facts. I spent hours deploying them. It was known, it was my whole approach. I was fascinated by statistics and having had the training in science, first find the facts and then deduce your conclusion. John Major consciously reacted against the Thatcher style. I've only got one thing to say. It's nice to be back. <laughs> His first cabinet was all male and known as the cabinet of chums. You don't have to shout and stamp your foot to make decisions. It's not always the people who shout loudest who have the most to say. And it's often someone who perhaps is a little reserved about putting forward an idea, who perhaps has something that's wholly original that ought to be properly examined. Uh, so I do encourage that. It does often mean longer cabinets, but I think that is worthwhile. Now, John is an immensely consensual person. I mean, he, first of all, he'd have seen how not to do it um, and, and wanted to, to have a reaction to that. Uh, but he is, by nature, a, a, a guy who, whilst he has his own very clear views, he's very courteous and, and very patient and uh, um, does listen and treat people with respect. And so the atmosphere changed overnight. One of Major's ministers said that at first it was like the release of the prisoners in the opera Fidelio. They'd emerged blinking into the sunlight of real cabinet government. But it was not to last. Ambitious young Eurosceptic ministers like Michael Portillo and John Redwood joined the cabinet as the Major government ran into stormy waters. I was over the moon to become a cabinet minister. It didn't quite work out as I was imagining when I first joined it. I soon got the impression that the Prime Minister didn't like extended or lengthy debates in Cabinet. He, he felt they would be divisive, whereas I felt that we, we had some disagreements that needed to be aired and that we needed to seriously ask ourselves where we were going. Major grew to feel increasingly under siege as his divided Cabinet began to fall apart under pressure. When Tony Blair took over, he decided to run Cabinet in a very different way. Rather than taking contentious issues to the full Cabinet, Blair preferred to try and reach agreements in Cabinet subcommittees or on a one-to-one -one basis with Ministers. Other Prime Ministers had also done this, but none had taken it as far as Blair. He inherited a situation where the alleged benefits of decision-making at Cabinet meetings had been exposed to be politically disastrous for the Conservative Party under John Major and disastrous for this country and the people who live in it and jobs here it was terrible. So he set his face against that perfectly understandably uh, and uh, worked with individuals or small groups of ministers or through cabinet committees and sell them through the full machinery of the cabinet. Look, I would be pretty shocked if the first time I knew a cabinet minister felt strongly about something was if they raised it at the cabinet table. I would expect them to come and knock on my door and say, look, Tony, I've got a problem here. I disagree with this or disagree with that. And that happens from time to time. And people do that. And then you, you sit down and you work it out. The Millennium Dome provided a rare example of a big issue going to cabinet. The dome was just a computer graphic when Blair came to power and the government had to decide whether to go ahead with the project. It was still just a vast building site in Greenwich. And six miles upriver, Blair held a cabinet meeting. He began by saying that he'd become convinced that the dome should be built, but he then handed the chair to his deputy, John Prescott. He announced to me that he had to leave because he had to do the House of Commons church service. And I was a bit surprised and said, you go into the church service. Well, if you're leaving me, say a prayer for me, will you? <laughs> because there were very strong views about the dome. Quite a number of people were saying, well, if it, if it doesn't succeed, it'll be a waste of money. And I have to confess, I was rather more extreme than that. My view was that three quarters of a billion pounds, even if it succeeded, it would be a waste of money compared with spending it on other things. At the cabinet meeting, Dobson said the best thing to do with the dome would be to fire it into outer space. Most other ministers were also against the dome, although Gordon Brown suggested it might go ahead if some strict conditions were met. I'm in the chair and I hear those views and I report properly back to a prime minister the general view of the cabinet and 
how the debate went and then for the Prime Minister to make a decision.